Happy holidays, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to today's Hangout. I'm Monique Bowman, today's moderator. And with us today, we have Robin Frazier. Uh, he's an assistant coach with the New York Red Bulls. Uh, coach Frazier will be presenting at the NSCA convention in January. And today, we'll be discussing attacking and, more specifically, unpredictability and how, what role it plays in attacking. Uh, we'll also touch on his career path to his current position and a, little, uh, a few other things as well. Um, as we are talking today, if you have questions, you are welcome to send them in to us. You can email them to marketing at nscaa.com or you can uh, tweet them to us to at nscaa using the nscaa Philly hashtag. So we'll go ahead and get started into today's conversation. Uh, Coach, can you just describe your, your career path um, in your own words, and obviously, and then um, do you recommend that? path for aspiring coaches? Uh, first of all, hey Monique, uh, good morning. Thanks for having me on. Um, looking forward to spending this half an hour. Anytime I can talk about soccer, that's a good thing. <laughs> Great. Uh, so with relation to my pathway to where I am today, it was um, a lot of playing and loving the game and really investing myself in the game and uh, a little bit of luck and some opportunities. I mean, for me, it was a long career of playing um, I feel like I never wanted to do anything else. <laughs> so I really threw myself into it. And uh, you learn a lot as you go along the way and you pick up some things and you start to think about things you like that coaches have done and things that you don't like that coaches have done. You start to think about ways that you think you might be able to do it better. And uh, I think it just became a natural evolution uh, of me that I wanted to continue to, to really delve into how players are developed and what we can do differently in this country. So once I got done playing, um, you know, it was the kind of thing where I was coaching, doing youth coaching almost the whole time I was playing. And once you start coaching, it makes you think about the game a little bit differently, which I think helped my playing career as well. Yeah. But once I got done playing, then it was about how could I get into this. And I was fortunate and I fell into the assistant coaching position at Real Salt Lake and then I've been in it ever since. Okay. And you've um, had experience both as an assistant coach and a um, head coach. Can you kind of talk about the differences between the two uh, for aspiring coaches? Yeah. Pressure. <laughs> <laughs> pressure. When the buck stops at your name, then yeah. uh, obviously there's a lot more pressure. Uh, really, I think, you know, as a head coach, you, you never turn it off. It's mm -hmm. always, always going in your head. And as an assistant coach, it's about 23 hours a day it's going, so you probably get that one extra hour of <laughs> sleep or rest as an assistant coach. Yeah. But yeah, in seriousness, you know, the big differences are you do have to make, uh, you weigh in on every decision that affects the club. And uh, little from the smallest details to the, to the biggest ones, you're involved in everything. As, a, as an assistant coach, it certainly depends on your situation. At Real Salt Lake, I felt like I was involved in a lot of things. Um, until I became a head coach and realized how much more is probably going on behind the scenes that <laughs> I wasn't necessarily aware of. But it's just that feeling that the buck stops with you and you literally weigh in on every decision. Um, and this question was sent in and because um, you kind of touched on it a little bit. How important is, uh, is it for aspiring coaches to mentally and psychologically train to um, coach at the professional level? Well, I think it's... Uh, that's a question that we could probably spend a half an hour on, to be quite honest, because coaching at the professional level is, um, a lot of it is player management. Uh, it's, you, you need to get the right players, you need to get talented players, but at the end of the day, it's managing those players to get the best out of them. And in terms of training, I think some people have it naturally. I think uh, some people, most people probably do need to consult with professionals to figure out how to deal with different types of personalities, and some of it is feel that you gain along the way, especially if you've played and you've been around a number of different types of players. Uh, I think it's important that you, you, you expose yourself to various and different uh, mentalities because I think the easiest trap to fall into as a coach is that you coach the way you want it to be coached, mm -hmm. and that seems to make sense to you, but the way you approach a game is not necessarily the way the next person or the next person or the next person approaches a game. So one of the big keys, I think, is your ability to recognize that personalities are different, yeah. that you have to be adaptable, and that you have to be able to figure out how to treat player A versus player B 
to get the most out of them. So I would say that yes, there is a fair amount of psychological uh, training that certainly could go into play into making you a successful coach. Great, a lot of good stuff in there. Um, and thinking through your uh, your coaching career, what are three to four keys that has helped you kind of ascend to your level right now? Just because we just talked about that, I'll I'll say this adaptability is something that I've figured out along the way. Uh, I certainly came into coaching feeling like I, I want to coach the way that I wanted to be coached. Mm. And the things that work for me maybe didn't don't, don't necessarily work for everyone else. And that's something that I've had to figure out along the way. And you need to figure out what it takes to, to push each player to their, to their best. So uh, you have to be tactically aware. You've got to be able to figure out, you know, it's not, this is not England where, uh, or the EPL or La Liga or somewhere where you have basically the money to go out and get every single player you want to play your perfect desired formation. You have to be able to, you know, there's some part of getting the players that you need and there's some part of figuring out what you've got at the end of the day and then how best to make it make it work. And again, it, it, play, it speaks to adaptability. Uh, I think for me, <clears throat> one of the big things is learning and really kind of treating the game as, as uh, this learning process. And throughout the whole time I was playing, I was always asking questions. I was trying to figure out why certain things were the way they were and how could things be better and how can we find solutions. And uh, I think you have to have an approach like that. If you come in and you think that the game is going to be black and white, and you're going to do this and this is going to happen, then I think you're kind of fooling yourself. So a little bit of experience in, in terms of figuring out not only player management, uh, player uh, talent pool, but then it's how to figure out to manage what you have and obviously your your tactical awareness of your own team and I think being able to spot tactical weaknesses of other teams. And these are all very important parts of being a coach, I think. Okay, great. Now let's get in, get, getting into attacking and unpredictability. Um, and thinking back to your playing days, was, was there a teammate or an opponent, opponent that uh, was just great at creating those moments? Um, you know, there was, I was thinking about that and thinking about some of the really incredible players that were around when the league started. And uh, Mauricio Cienfuegos, who I played with in L.A. for many years, he's five foot three. If you'd see him walking down the street, you'd never think this guy's a <laughs> soccer player, much as an absolute stud. Yeah. Uh, he was one of those who, could, who was very unpredictable, and that's what made him so good. At his size, he would never be able to function if, if, if you knew what he was going to do all the time. Mm. So he was one of those who could really unbalance defenders or opposing defenses because he really was able to look like he's going to do one thing and be able to do something totally different. Uh, players like himself, Marco Echeverri, uh, Valderamo is a little bit different because with his passing, he, you've never seen anyone affect a game with passing like him because he was never going to run by anybody. But he was, his vision was unbelievable. His execution was amazing. And then another one of those is, uh, is Preki, who was amazing in different ways. He could also hit very, very good passes, but on the ball, you could swear you know exactly where Preki's going, and two seconds later, he's behind you and he's gone. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the players I thought made, made the league really exciting over the years. Clint Mathis, when I played with him, was a very young player who is arguably one of the most talented American players ever. And to watch his development as a young player was was really interesting because he became the type of player who could completely unbalance defenses by himself. And then uh, Claudio Reyna was one of my favorite players I ever played with because although he wasn't a dynamic player that's going to run by people, he was the best at uh, setting things up to look like he's going to go one place and play the pass into someplace else. Great vision, uh, great first touch, um, really a player who, who could make a team go. Those are some of the guys that I think about when I think about my playing days. Okay. And what role does a coach play into um, creating those, those moments or um, fostering an environment for unpredictable moment, moments? Uh, that's, that's the $100 million question because I think every team and every coach in the world is looking to create those moments consistently. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it is getting the right players because at the end of the day on the field, players have to make the decisions. But in terms of setting it up, I think it's about training sessions where you create a mentality of you're trying to either you're trying to play the ball into certain areas of the field to force defenders to have to step out to defend and as they step out to defend gaps are created and that's what you're looking for and that's how you're going to be dangerous. So if you look at a team like Barcelona <clears throat> who uh, 
who would probably put in two to three hundred passes more per game than their opponent, they would literally pass in front of the, the back four, in front of the back six of the opposing team so much to try and pull players out of position. And as a player gets pulled out of position, the ball gets played back, then it's played into the gap that that player just left. So um, you try to create situations in your training sessions where you're thinking about setting up plays. So a lot of the very, very good attacks <clears throat> um, come off opportunities that are created by being able to pull defenders out of positions. It's by either carrying the ball or passing the ball into certain areas that are going to force defenders to step out. And as soon as you get defenders starting to move, if you have an alert team, and this is where the, part of it's a player awareness, part of it's a coach awareness, is to create these moments, recognize those moments, and you have players who are willing to make really hard committed runs. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a combination of a lot of things, but I think what you're trying to do is create an environment where players are thinking about moving defenders around, and then once they've, once they've created gaps, recognizing those gaps, and being able to make good committed runs and passes through those lanes. Okay. It's a lot um, of technical jargon for you. <laughs> no, it's, it's good. I'm sure all, all of our viewers are following along just fine. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, are there certain formations that lend themselves to these type of attacking opportunities? Um, that's a, it's, it's such an interesting question because formations become hot at certain times. They're like, mm. they're like you know, clothing. It's like fads. <laughs> okay. So for a long time, uh, let's say about 20 years ago, 3-5-2 was a formation. Then it went back to a 4-4-2. Everyone was playing with four defenders. And now it's gone to different versions of a 4-3-3. It could be a 4-2-3-1 or a 4-1-4-1 or a straight-up 4-3-3, which is again, back and dating back a number of years to the Dutch Ajax system. And I think the answer to the question really is mismatches in formations probably mm -hmm. uh, automatically set up uh, attacking opportunities. So if you're playing a 4-4-2 versus a 4-3-3, one of those teams is going to have to bend a little bit defensively depending on how the other team is doing. Um, so I think that uh, the mismatch is created, but at the end of the day, it's about the players. So whatever your system is, whatever your formation is, uh, it's about the players recognizing where space is, getting into those spaces, pulling defenders out of spaces, and other guys running through those spaces. So, for instance, uh, uh, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but just That's thinking okay. about some of the stuff we've spoken about in terms of um, teams around the league or in teams around the world, 4-3-3s mm -hmm. uh, often find uh, one high forward, two wingers, automatically you're spreading out the opposing defense. Um, and out of that, you can create gaps to run people through between the, de between the defenders. Uh, if you look at a team like Real Salt Lake that plays out of a 4-4-2, uh, but they play the diamond with their wide players pinched in, oftentimes the opposing outside backs don't have anyone to mark because they're, you know, the wingers they're expecting to mark aren't really there. They're tucked in and inside. And as those players start looking for players to go and mark, then their space is created outside of them and behind them. So either formation or any of the formations can, can create good attacking scenarios. It's about players who are good at recognizing where the gaps are and are willing to make hard committed runs. And uh, it could come out of any formation, to be quite honest. And at the end of the day, I think the formation is a structure out of which players can make good decisions, can execute plays, unbalance defenses and get in behind defenses. And at the end of the day, that's the objective. Would you say like that plays into creativity of a player? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, okay. I think if you have, <clears throat> I think this is where you're going with this question. Uh, <laughs> I think if you have players who are creative, then the more of those you have, the more unpredictable you are in your attack. Okay. If you have players who are all very, very vanilla, they all have a good first touch and play a safe pass every time, then you might have a lot of possession, but it's very difficult to get in behind teams. Mm -hmm. And obviously the goal is not in front of teams, the goal is behind teams, so we're trying to get back there. Uh, so I think that um, having players who are able to think a couple of steps ahead and having groups of players who are able to think a couple of steps ahead lead, lend themselves automatically to making your team a better team. Um, you have a lot of good teams that have very good soccer players but no one who's really forward-thinking or not enough players who are really forward-thinking. And as I said, you end up with 
teams that can really possess the ball but never really threaten. Okay. You mentioned earlier um, about training sessions. Uh, how much time is spent on attacking um, for your training sessions, and is it a group effort, or are you just taking the forwards aside and focusing on it? Right. And with New York, uh, we're we're an interesting we're an interesting group of players for sure. Um, I would say we probably spend twenty five percent of our time on final third stuff. Okay. Um, sometimes it's just the forwards. Forwards need their finishing. They're going to get the balls in certain spots of the field and. You want to give them a lot of repetition in their first touch and their choices, and then obviously their choices of how to finish. Uh, then a lot of it are the attack involves also outside backs getting involved, uh, midfielders running through gaps. So at the end of the day, most of our training or finishing, attacking finishing sessions are involving most everyone with the exception of the central defenders. Okay. I would say more times than not, they're not that involved. But it's either... <clears throat> It's either times where the forwards are working together consistently. Uh, again, it's just repetition, repetition, repetition for them. Because obviously in the game, you can create a ton of opportunities. But if you get it into your forward who's not comfortable in that tiny little bit of space that you've worked so hard to create, mm -hmm. then the finish doesn't happen. So it's all, the whole thing is a process. So at the end of it, certainly, is the, the piece with the forwards. But prior to that, too, there's movement. There's coordination of movement. There's timing of movement. There's services. There's early services in behind the defenders. There's getting behind the defenders wide and then service back into the box. So in working at all of that, you really do end up using just about everyone on the field. Okay. Um, and getting into coaching um, Thierry Henry, uh, what he brings to the field, can, you, can that be taught, you feel, or is it just natural? Uh, Thierry, I think, is probably safe to say he's in the top I don't know, 25 players ever to have played the game. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you teach a lot of what he's got. Uh, I, think, I think there are players who are born with things that are very, very special. Uh, and I think the environment in which they develop and nurture these thoughts is important. So if Thierry Henry grows up someplace else, is he one of the top 25 players in the world? Maybe, maybe not. But growing up in a very, very good system um, allowed him to really develop his thought process. His technical ability would, always, would probably always have been there had he grown up somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, he would have always been a very good technical player. But would he have always been able to make the tactical decisions that he can now and see the field the way that he does? That probably is something that I would question. Mm -hmm. So I think that the genius you can't necessarily teach. You can help nurture that genius, okay. but I think you have to put all players, and this is where I think our, our youth development in this country is starting to, to move or starting to go in this direction, is that we as coaches have to put our players in situations where they have to make decisions. Mm -hmm. I think in this country, we often spoon feed them the decisions, and it's just like in school, if you're given the answers and it's just regurgitation, you're mm -hmm. great for a short period of time, but you really learn it, and does it really become part of you? Mm -hmm. So I think that for us as a country going forward, and the onus is on the coaches to really sit and think about training sessions that are going to force the players to have to make decisions. And you keep putting them in, in decision-making uh, uh, decision arenas over and over and over and over again, then some of the good decisions just become instinctive. They can automatically tell by just scanning the field that the numerical advantage is here or it's not here. And if it's not here, maybe we should go someplace else. And if we do have a numerical advantage here, these are the ways we can move these. The three of us can move these two defenders to then get in behind them. So I do think that uh, you can, you, we can make players better for sure. And we, it's, it's a big focus of what's going on in the league right now. Um, and I actually within the country, to be honest. But can you teach a genius of a Thierry Henry and a Lionel Messi? Uh, I highly, highly doubt that. I think the genius is a genius. We just, the rest of us are just trying to make sure we can be as good as we can. Oh, okay, good, good way to put it. Uh, for coaches who who maybe have that one special player, um, do you have any advice on for them on how to communicate what they want, need to communicate to those players? Again, I think it's uh, so much of it is 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 decision making process over and over again because uh, if you have the 12-year-old player or the 
yeah, say, 12-year-old player who's an exceptional dribbler, um, you have to think really, think forward. Is this going to be able to sustain him for his whole career? Mm -hmm. And if this is not his thing, if he's not Lionel Messi, who's arguably one of the two players in the world who can run by guys at, at you know at, at their own will, mm -hmm. if you're not one of these two players, then you need to equip them with some decision making capabilities as well. Because at the end of the day, if all that player can do is dribble, as you <laughs> get older and older, teams get more sophisticated, defending gets more sophisticated. That player who was a really promising 12 year old player maybe at 17 or 18 isn't that good because he can't do anything. He can't pick his head up and he can't make a decision. Mm -hmm. So I think that even with a special player, you have to encourage them in the right moments to be special and do those things and beat players. But you also have to encourage them to be able to figure out uh, the decision-making process and recognizing when, because I'm a good dribbler, I've drawn four people around me. If I've drawn these four people around me, can I slip it into the next guy and now create a two versus one in front of the opponent's goal? Just things along those lines. So I think that uh, we have a tendency historically in this country to almost let the best players do their thing because they're so good. And I think that we have to put demands on them just like we do everyone else. And the demands on the special player might be a little bit different than the demand on the player who isn't quite as special because he, he's capable of, he or she are capable of doing things that are a little bit different maybe than the rest. And if that's the case, you keep pushing them harder and harder. And also you try to put them in the best possible environments. Okay. Oh, we have another question that was sent in. A little, um, little maybe a little off from our topic right now, but it's still something interesting, from Casey Huckle. What, what are the typical reasons a team struggle to score goals, and what suggestions do you have to solve those problems? Phenomenal question. Phenomenal <laughs> question. I was, at, uh, I was at Chivas USA for a couple of years, and uh, we actually became one of those teams we spoke about where, uh, no kidding, we had 80% possession in this one game and lost 1-0. And I think we had three shots on goal. So <clears throat> if you have a team that's struggling to score a goal, the keys are you have to be able to unbalance defenders mm -hmm. or defenses and get behind them. If you can't get behind defenses, then you're looking at scoring from 35 yards consistently. That's mm -hmm. a very, very difficult scenario. So you've got to be able to move defenders. You've got to get the ball into areas that are going to make the defenders either come apart width-wise or step out of their group. And when those gaps are created, you've got to be able to get the ball back in there, into those gaps. And the key is you can be methodical in your buildup. You can play at a certain tempo to be able to have control of the ball, move defenders. But as soon as, the ball, as soon as you get a defender, as soon as you get gaps created in the defense, you have to be able to switch your tempo, and it's got to get through there quickly, whether it's a sprint with the ball, sprint without the ball, and a ball played through there. There's definitely a tempo that is necessary to be able to break teams down. And it's got to be about once you find those moments that defenders have moved, they've either stepped forward, as I said, or gaps have been created. You've got to get good, hard, committed runs to get through there. You, get, you have to have attack-minded players to deliver the pass, and you have to have very attack-minded players to make hard, committed runs through. Okay, great. And getting into convention, can you kind of uh, give us a quick overview of your session? Yeah, my session... I was trying to think of what I really wanted to do when I was asked to do it. Mm -hmm. And the last time I was at the convention, I think my assumption was, because I was asked to do it, that everyone would expect me to do a defending session. That's the last thing I wanted to do. So I did an attacking <laughs> session. But going into this one and thinking a lot about uh, what our team was like this year, uh, I decided to do a defending session because for all the reasons we've just spoken about for 23 minutes, <laughs> uh, teams get pulled apart and teams give up goals. So, and we do teach a lot of the attacking stuff. In this country, we talk about a lot of possession and we talk about scoring goals and we talk about you know, a lot of you know, the sexy stuff on the attacking side of the field. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, everyone says all the time, defense win championships. The teams that defend the best and the most cohesively usually go the furthest. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a session about defending. It's a team defending session, and it starts from individual defending going into defending in groups of two. And for me, defending in groups of two is the most important thing in defending because if you can figure out how two, two defenders together or two players together can work against one player on the ball, then you should be able to, to obviously win the ball and restart your attack. 
So it's a, it's a team defending session that starts with individual stuff and goes all the way to team concepts and things that we're looking for and your movement as a team and that sort of thing. And I do think at the end of the day, every coach probably has their own style of how they want to do things. But mm -hmm. for me, it's a, it's a very clear mentality in taking away the direct route to the goal and then trying to make it predictable defensively because as we've spoken about, if the attack is very unpredictable, then you've got defenders all over the place trying to deal with things. So the sooner me or my team as a defensive unit can make the other team play where I want them to play, mm. now it becomes a little bit more predictable. Winning the ball becomes a little bit more predictable. Excellent. Well, I think that's um, all we can do right now. Um, <laughs> Uh, I want to thank Coach for taking the time for uh, to share his knowledge with us and uh, all that fun stuff. And if you are planning on to planning on attending the convention, uh, Coach Frazier will be presenting on Thursday, January sixteenth at three forty-five. His session is presented by the NSCAA Black Soccer Coaches Committee, and it's entitled "Dictating the Ball," uh, "Dictating the Game Without the Ball." So again, thanks, Coach, for uh, the time, and we'll see everyone in January. You are.